We can read, but we don't always comprehend. We can hear, but we don't always understand. We can touch, but we don't always feel. We can look, but we don't always see. The Bible testifies of the one that saves. It screams out. The name above all names, the Lamb of God, the Mighty and Eternal One, the King who was and is and is to come. And because we may be blind to see the light, it is our deepest plea, our prayer with all our might. Unveil our eyes, our minds, and our hearts. Unveil Jesus to us in the Gospel of Mark. The title of today's message is Jesus is the Messiah. We've been following this uh, book of Mark. Uh, I, call this the ser- I call this series The uh, Unveil uh, because I wanted us to meet Jesus from this series, not just a s- story, white, white paper, black uh, letters, but I wanted us to encounter Jesus through uh, this series. That's why I, I called it Unveil. I pray that through this, that God will unveil our eyes and see more than just letters on the page, but actually see Jesus through it and meet Jesus in person. It is my prayer for all of you guys. Okay, and today uh, is the final, kind of finale of season one. Season one consists of six episodes, um, and each episode we uncover w- who Jesus was or who Jesus is. Okay, uh, the, the season's name was called The Adventure in Galilee because everything that we talked about up to chapter 8, which is today, uh, happened in uh, around Galilee area. Okay? And then soon they're going to be journeying towards uh, Jerusalem, uh, to, and, and it will eventually Jesus will be crucified there. All right? So today is the, one of the last things we're going to talk about um, in, that happened in uh, Jerusalem area, Galilee area. Galilee area, okay? Um, last week, uh, I shared with some of you that I uh, was in North Carolina, okay, last whole week. I went there Monday. I came back on Thursday. Uh, I was the guest speaker at a youth conference. There was about 100, 320 students gathered. It was big. It's a big group of students from all over the states, uh, all the Korean churches in town. All, everybody uh, gathers once a year, which was pretty amazing, and over 300 students were there, and uh, about 50 uh, college to adult staff uh, who were there to support, and uh, many other pastors from each church were there to support, and uh, close to about 400 people were there uh, during this conference. Um, when I was dropped off at the conference, so what, what the hosting church, church's pastor, uh, he, he, like, you know, we took me around, and he fed me lunch, and then he drove me to the retreat center, which was about two hours away from the, that church. He dropped me off at the conference, um, and there was an awkward period, because like nobody really knew who I was, and I don't know anybody there. I just knew like, a couple people that I communicate through email, but like, we, we really didn't know each other. So I didn't know what to do, uh, or where to go, or who to be with, so I stayed in my room for a while, and that's really, that really bothers me because I'm a people person. I like to get to know people, but everybody's so, so busy that if I were to like inject myself into the conversation, I, don't wanna, I didn't want to bother anyone. So for, for some time, I just like stayed in my room. Okay? Um, and then I headed over to the chapel uh, before the worship began, and you know, I did come across several students and uh, adult leaders, and the thing is no one knew who I was when I first got there, before I started to speak. And, um, and it was not until the, one of the pastors there, who was the worship leader, he introduced me, Pastor BJ from New York, as a guest speaker. And he actually happens to be from New York as well. He was, he was born and raised here. He was here until recently, and then he became pastor in North Carolina. And he introduced me as a, a guest speaker. And then uh, people figured out who I was. Uh, oh, oh, that guy was the, uh, guest, is the guest speaker of this conference, okay? 
It wouldn't it be strange if like no one made the introduction, right? If no one said anything about who I was or what I was going to do, and I just come up to the stage and just speak. Like my identity was hidden and not even the staff knew uh, that I was the guest speaker and I just go up there to preach. They would think that I was crazy. I mean, they may eventually figure it out. Yeah, usually at a conference, there's a speaker, but we don't know this guy. Nobody introduced this guy. There was no information on this guy. He just comes up and speaks, okay? There will be a confusion in the beginning, at least. Maybe they'll try to like drag me down. Like, who are you? Who are you to speak here, right? Um, anyway, uh, thankfully, uh, people figured out who I was. Yeah, I was introduced as, properly as a guest speaker, and people figured out who I was, and things were okay. Uh, eventually, the staff member would come to me and introduce himself to me and would talk to me, and I even had a chance to counsel some of the youth kids who were actually going through some serious crisis in their lives. Okay, so it was an overall great time, and the thing is, like, I missed you guys when I was there. Because like, I didn't know anyone. Like, you know, I come to KCQ, and I know all you guys. You know me. So there is this, uh, already, like, there's this bond already, right? But when I was there, I had to recreate that, and I had such a short time, uh, and they weren't there to like, bond with me anyway. So I kind of I missed you even from the beginning. Um, so when Jesus came on the scene, he didn't, in the beginning, he didn't announce himself as the Messiah. It took some people to figure out who this guy was. I mean, he speaks like a Messiah, okay? Messiah means the Savior that God would send. He acted like a Messiah, and he definitely did the miracles like the Messiah. Uh, but still, majority of the people who are following him around, they were still deciding on their opinion on Jesus, who is this guy really? Is he the Messiah? Is he not? They're debating amongst each other. Okay. There were many uh, speculations and, and guesses about the identity of Jesus Christ. Okay. If Jesus is not the Messiah, and there, there was no point of following him around, really. Right? They're waste, wasting time. But if Jesus is the Messiah, then it would be beneficial for them to be around Jesus. Okay. Their idea of Messiah was wrong, by the way, and I will talk about that soon. What the Messiah was supposed to be, was supposed to do, is this, and I'll just, uh, that's part of the big idea today, so you should write that down. Jesus is the Messiah who saves us from sin and eternal death. Jesus is the Messiah who saves us from sin and eternal death. The reason the Jews could not make up their minds well, even after several rounds of teachings and miracles, you know, and conquering the storm and feeding of 5,000, you know, disciples finally understood that he was who he, who he was supposed to be. But there were many others who did not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They only thought of him as, as special as some kind of prophet, okay, like John the Baptist, Elijah, or other prophets that maybe like a reincarnated prophet or maybe just a brand new prophet. Um, God hasn't sent a prophet to the nation of Israel for about four to 500 so far, for 100 years so far. So they were kind of thirsty for God to speak to them. So maybe, they're like, they, maybe he is like one of those prophets in the old days. Okay. The reason for their speculation is probably because of the, the slowness of Jesus' move back into Jerusalem, okay, to take back the country from the Roman Empire. Okay, what they wanted, their misconception of Messiah, is that they wanted Jesus to be the political Messiah. He wanted Jesus to free and conquer the country back from the ruling of Roman Empire. They were expecting to see it and they'll probably, they probably would have said, if Jesus came back, he just, if Jesus took back Jerusalem, then they'll finally say, oh, that's the Messiah that God sent. Okay. They wanted a, a political leader like Gideon or Samson or perhaps a king like David, a warrior like David. But all they saw was a prophet, maybe like a local celebrity, 
And everybody's talking about him. And he's doing great things, yet not a, not a Messiah yet. But Jesus did not come to save Israelites and only Israelites from the Roman Empire. He wasn't here. He, wasn't, he didn't come just so that the Israel can become their own country. Jesus came to save the world from the empire, not Roman Empire, but empire of sin and death. Jesus came to free not just Israelites under Roman Empire, but Jesus came to free everyone who would believe in him from the empire of sin and death. Okay, Jesus is the Messiah sent by God and knowing who Jesus is gives us, to, gives us a reason to listen to him. Right? If he were to say something, why would they listen to him, right? Why would they listen and adhere to his teaching? Only reason people should listen to him is because he is the Messiah who God sent. Let's go to Mark chapter 8, verse 27 and 28. Jesus went out with his disciples to village, villages of Caesarea, Philippi, and on the road, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Still others, one of the prophets. Jesus is the Lord who speaks. A prophet is the one, is, are, the, are the people who spoke on behalf of God. Okay? But Jesus is the Lord who speaks. Jesus asked the disciples about how people view Jesus. Who do people say that I am? Right? And not because Jesus, people's opinion was important for Jesus, uh, but their salvation was important. Their belief in Jesus as a Messiah was what counted. Okay. And disciples answered, they think you are the reincarnated prophets or some of the new, new prophet God may have sent. Um, because Jesus spoke and taught like the prophets, right? Prophets had, uh, they came on the scene, they spoke on behalf, on the, on behalf of God. Uh, that's what prophesying usually means, okay? So the way Jesus was speaking and teaching had the authority like that of old-time prophets. So they're like, yeah, I think he is one of the prophets, And they weren't really completely wrong to assess Jesus as that. Uh, but, you know, he's not an ordinary prophet who speaks on behalf of God. Okay? He's, not, he's not on the same level of these human prophets. Okay? Even Elijah, who, who Israel considers as like one of the super prophets, okay? he's not on the same level as them. Far superior. Jesus is not, was not only speaking the word of God. He was not only uh, speaking on behalf of God. He is the word of God himself. Let's look at John 1.1, 1, 1, okay? Some, some uh, verses throughout. It says, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay? God's word is not just, um, just you know, con- that, uh, a thing that consists of letters and sounds, but it's a powerful being. It is God, Jesus. Okay? John, verse one, John chapter 1, verse 14 uh, says this, The word which was in the beginning and with God, and he was God, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's talking about Jesus here. We observed his glory. We saw him. We saw his glory. The glory as the one and only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word of God himself who speaks the word of God to us. Therefore, his words have authority, which we completely submit to. Therefore, the world even though they don't believe in him, will eventually be subjected 
to his word because he is God. Therefore, the Bible, which records the words Jesus spoke, and it, which talks about Jesus himself, which Jesus uh, proved and verified that it is the word of God, has the authority, should have the authority of believers' lives. Okay. You can't believe in Jesus without believing that the Bible is the true word of God. How else would you know to believe in Jesus without the Bible declaring that we must believe in him? It's an irony. It's an oxymoron to say, oh, I believe in Jesus as the Savior, but I don't think the Bible is true. So many, uh, there are, it's, it's, it has changed so much over time. It didn't. I can prove that to you. If you give me two hours, I can prove that the Bible didn't change. Uh, it's as close to the original writing as it can be. Okay. John chapter 20, verse 31, it says this. Uh, same guy is writing this. But these are written, okay, the Bible now, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The Word of God itself is pre declaring to us that there's no other name but in the name of Jesus that can save us. So when we read the Bible, although Jesus is not with us physically, we must hear our Lord Jesus Christ speaking to us. God's Word triumphs over all teachings of the world. Let's go to the next uh, verse, verse 29. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. Okay. It's a short version of his response. I think that Matthew records it with a few more words. Okay. Second is Jesus is the Lord who saves. Jesus is the Lord who saves. After hearing the, the speculation of people, Jesus asked uh, Peter, uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter confessed, you are the Messiah. Not just the prophet, but you're the Messiah that God has sent. This was a great confession of faith, and Peter does not realize this, uh, emphasize, uh, he doesn't emphasize this for reason, I think. Uh, but Matthew, who was also there hearing Jesus speaking, uh, hearing Jesus asking the question, uh, hearing Peter's response, uh, and Jesus' response to Peter's response, he records it like this. Okay, Matthew record, recorded a little more about what happened at the, at that, in the, during this dialogue. Okay? If you go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it says this, And I also say to you that you are Peter. So she, Peter's name used to be Simon. Now Jesus is like, I'm going to call you Peter now. Peter means the rock. Okay? He was the original, the rock, Dwayne Johnson. Right? right. And on this rock... Uh, check the, this is the wordplay right here. He's like he's using pun here. Okay, he's like I'm gonna call you the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, gates of hell, will not overpower it. I think at the point Peter shared this with Mark, I don't think he wanted to emphasize this point about Jesus' response. So Mark didn't, he, you know, he didn't include it in the gospel. It's my speculation, by the way. I think Peter was humble. Oh, yeah, Jesus says, on me, God will build my church, build his church. I don't think Peter, who was testifying uh, about Jesus to Mark, who's writing this down, I don't think he would have said that, like emphasizing himself, elevating himself, okay? But Matthew, who heard Peter's confession and Jesus' response, he was there too. He records himself in his gospel on this rock, on this confession of faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Church is built on the faith in Jesus Christ. Church is not a club. Church is not a social gathering. Uh, church is not a place where we have religious activity. Church is built on 
the faith that we have in our Messiah. Church is a gathering of people who make the same confession of faith in Jesus. Now think about this for a second, okay? So many people there with Jesus, and they all heard the message, they all, heard the, they all saw the miracle, but they did not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They did not believe that Jesus is the Savior. So you can be a part of this youth group and hear this message. Hear the message preached to you over and over about Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. You are a sinner, and Jesus can save you from your sins. The result of sin is eternal death. If you die right now without believing Jesus, you will go to hell. But Jesus offers salvation. He wants to save you. And you hear this message every single Sunday, and you can still miss out. You can still not believe in Jesus. Just like these people who saw his preaching, who saw the miracles, you would think that if Jesus showed up today, I would believe in him. No. So many people saw Jesus 2,000 years ago, and they still didn't believe. I pray that my words don't fall on deaf ears. I pray that you hear this message and that you believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior of sinners. So you see, the religious pluralism is a norm today. You know what that means, religious pluralism? It means every road leads to the same destination. Whatever you want to believe, that's fine. If you want to believe in Allah or Buddha or whatever religion you choose to believe, everything will come and will, you'll reach the same goal together. If you want to be a good, if you don't want to be part of an organized religion and just be, uh, just be a good person on your own, you will still get there. Uh, that's the religious pluralism. Okay? It's not new, by the way. It's been around for year, ages. But if, if there is God who wants to save his people and if there are, there are multiple ways to be saved, then why would God choose to kill his own son on the cross? Think about that. Okay? If there are other ways, if we could earn our own salvation then why would God go to that extent, extinct, extent yeah, to kill his own son on the cross? Why would he do that? Right? He did that because that's the only way. Him willingly killing his own son, sending him to the earth for, to, as a Messiah and putting him on the cross was the only way for us to be saved. Therefore, if anyone says there are many other ways to get there, it's an evil talk. Because God loved the world and he sent his son to save us, to put him on the cross to save us. He gave us his son so that we would be saved. And we're saying, no, that is one of the ways, maybe not even that way. We can get there by our own, own, own work. You know, this, this God that people are talking about, this God can also save us. That's an evil talk. Mark chapter 8, verse 30. Let's go to the last verse. He says, and he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. That's kind of strange, isn't it? He strictly warned them, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah. Because Jesus is the Lord who times. It's, it sounds a little weird. I wanted to like rhyme everything. So, you know, Jesus is the Lord who, who talks, who speaks. Jesus is the Lord who saves. And Jesus is the Lord who times. What I mean by I'll explain to you why I, I named it like that. I put it like that. Okay. Um, if Jesus came to earth to save people, okay, and if you have to believe him as the Messiah, 
to be saved, and the disciples finally figure out that Jesus is the Messiah, why would he want, him, want them to keep it quiet and not share with anyone? It's because it's not time yet. It's not time for him to be revealed as a Messiah yet. The time will come, the time will be fulfilled when the Son of God will be revealed to the world as the Messiah. The time, of course, is when he gets crucified and on the third day he gets resurrected. Until then, Jesus must suffer for the sake of us, the lost. Okay? If, if, if the disciples go around telling everybody, this is a Messiah, and they try to prove to them through the Scripture that because Jesus fulfilled you know, over 300 prophecies of Old Testament, okay? so it was easy if they actually went through the Old Testament and compared, compared the Old Testament prophecies to Jesus, or, or everything lines up. It's, it would have been easier for them to easy for them to prove that Jesus is a Messiah. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. Don't tell anyone yet. If they did prove through the Scripture, because to the Jews, the Scripture at least is the highest authority. Okay? So if they were able to study the Scripture together, get the scribes, the Pharisees, all the ones who are like, hardcore, uh, you know, live and die for Scripture people, all come together and they study the scripture and compare it to Jesus Christ, then I believe that they would have believed, oh yeah, this is the promised Messiah. Okay. And then, I don't know, they, maybe they would crown him as a king and try to like, start this re uh, revolution, all these things. Things must happen and will happen according to God's timeline. Everything will happen according to his timing. We often get frustrated with things not happening by our timeline. We have our own timeline, and we get anxious and we get upset, we get disappointed because things are not happening according to our timeline. It's like we're telling God, this is a schedule, you must keep this. Okay. You better not be late. You, know, you better not mess, mess up my timeline. In the Bible, there are two different concepts of time. Okay? One, one is, the word is chronos, and the other is kairos. Chronos and kairos. They're both translated as time, but they have a different meaning. Okay? Chronos is the chronological timeline that we live in. It's, it's what we know well as time, okay? We start worship at 11 a.m. on Sunday. It's according to time of chronos. It's measurable. It's predictable, okay? It will come. Once 11 o'clock is over, 12 o'clock will come. But on the contrary, unlike chronos, kairos is, is not measurable and not predictable. It's according to God's timeline. Right? God has plan and things will unfold and happen based on the plan that he has, based on the timeline that he has, and we don't know that timeline. The second coming of Jesus, when he comes back to judge the world, will happen based on his timeline. Okay. And, and the Bible says no one knows the date and the hour when Jesus is coming back. So as soon as someone who claims to be a prophet says, oh, Jesus is coming back this year, this month, this day, at this time, then they are automatically wrong because we are not supposed to know this. There's no one in the world who's special enough for God to reveal the exact time and moment and a place of the return of Jesus Christ. Do you guys know a guy named Harold Camping? You probably wouldn't know. Harold Camping figured out, he calculated when Jesus was returning. Uh, I believe it was 2012, 
uh, October 15th, okay, in the middle of Manhattan. All right, he, I don't know where he got that. But anyway, so he made this huge campaign about telling everybody, Jesus, the Messiah is coming back. I, I believe he did it out of good heart. Okay, I, I want to give him some credit. He made an aware, people aware that Jesus is coming back. He made a whole big deal. He, did the, he bought billboards everywhere. He, you know, he, he did the broadcast. He had actually, he owned a broadcasting show. So he did like all these things and campaigned everything. Jesus is coming back. And a lot of people bought into it, you know. We're still here. And then so Jesus didn't come back. So he said, oh, I messed up because I calculated based on the Julian calendar. I was supposed to calculate based on the, the Jewish calendar, the lunar calendar. So we calculated, oh, it's actually five months later. So he did a camp- campaign again, whole like billboards, ads, everything. Again, Jesus did not come back. He's gone. Like, I don't know where he is. And, yeah. Jesus is the Messiah. He came 2,000 years ago to die on the cross to save us from our sins. Those of us who believe in him will be saved. Those of us who reject this message, even though you hear it from this pulpit over and over, even though you've heard it in your own lives over and over, if you reject it, then the salvation, I'm sorry, it's not yours. Okay? He is the Lord who speaks not on behalf of God, but he is the word himself. He is the Lord who saves, and he is the Lord who times. Things will happen according to his timeline, God's timeline, not our own. So if we are the people who believe in Jesus, who live according to not Kronos, but Kairos, the God's timeline, then our attitude should be different. We're expecting the Savior to come back to earth. We're expecting God to end this world eventually. If we don't see that with our own eyes, then we will die and we'll go to heaven if you believe in Jesus, okay? As a people who believe that, then our attitude daily should be different. Our attitude as the people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah should be different. Our goals are the pattern of our lives, the decision we make, uh, you know, the way we say no to sin, the way we pursue godliness, uh, all should all must reflect our faith in Jesus Christ. We cannot live our lives the same way as our unbelieving friends if we have the faith to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Let's pray. Father, we need you.